Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, we'll get started in just a moment. Thanks for joining today. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm Shannon Farley. I'm the director of ICAP Survey Unit. And uh, welcome to our grand rounds today. Uh, today is World Refugee Day. Oh, whoops, sorry. First, we're going to do the welcome. Uh, we'll have the presentation and then questions and answers. Uh, for questions to the panelists, use the Q&A box. And the webinar is being recorded, and we will post the slides at www.icap.columbia.edu afterwards. Uh, so welcome. Today is World Refugee Day, and we're going to present on the refugee crisis addressing the health of displaced populations. We're going to hear from three distinguished colleagues. First, we will hear from Dr. Sarah Casey, who is faculty in the Heilbrunn Department of Population and Family Health here at Columbia University for over two decades, Dr. Casey has worked to improve sexual and reproductive health and rights in countries whose health systems have been weakened by war. Dr. Casey directs the Reproductive Health Access Information and Services and Emergencies, or RAISE Initiative, a global program collaborating with partners to identify and respond to challenges to improve sexual and reproductive health services in humanitarian settings globally. Today, Dr. Casey will share the latest data on forcibly displaced populations globally and the health challenges they faced. Then we will hear from Dr. Sam Barraro, who is ICAP's country representative in Uganda and leads both the Uganda FIA and the Uganda Refugee FIA projects, which are PEPFAR supported population based HIV impact assessment surveys that reach 15,000 general population and almost 3,000 refugee households and enable multiple national and international. Uh, it, Households and engage multiple national and international stakeholders. Dr. Barraro began his career in clinical practice in Uganda, then worked in clinical research with Epicenter and MSF, and then population based surveillance at the Medical Research Council and the Uganda Virus Research Institute. Most recently, his work is focused on non communicable diseases. Today, Dr. Barraro will examine the impact of forced displacement on health and present findings from a recent study looking at the intersection 
reduction in mobility and health outcomes. Last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. Andrea Wirtz, who is a faculty member in the Department of Epidemiology and affiliated with the Center for Public Health and Human Rights and the Center for Humanitarian Health at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Her research focuses on community-partnered international and domestic epidemiologic research and interventions to address HIV and related health outcomes, with particular attention to populations that have been excluded from or invisible within research or otherwise traditionally underserved in health services. Internationally, she most recently served as joint principal and investigator of a community academic policy collaboration to estimate HIV prevalence and other health indicators among Venezuelan migrants and refugees in Colombia. Dr. Roberts will be presenting on her recent survey among Venezuelan refugees and migrants in Colombia today. So thank you all very much for being here and we're gonna let Dr. Casey get started. Thanks, Shannon. All right, today I'm going to kind of set the scene before our other two presenters talk about studies they've done among displaced populations. So today we have nearly 110 million people forcibly displaced. These numbers are accurate as of the end of 2022. This is the highest um, we've ever seen globally. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of complex emergencies, humanitarian settings. You know, we usually talk about a destabilizing event or series of events that then displaces a lot of people. We see loss of essential services, the situation somewhat stabilizes, essential services come back. We basically, you know, moving on to relative stability and hopefully a return to normality. But in many places, we see that the continuum of an emergency is not a linear process, but rather involves sort of flare-ups of violence that may um, cause a new acute crisis. And you know, when conflict spreads, we may see people being displaced multiple times or for multiple places. Also, just to be clear, the average length of time that people are displaced is about 20 years. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the number of people forcibly displaced globally has more than doubled in the last 10 years. Um, now, at the end of 2022, one in 74 people around the world is forcibly displaced, which is more than 1% of the global population. Uh, 2022 saw the largest annual increase ever, largely because of the Ukraine and um, Afghanistan crises, uh, which really bumped up the numbers. And just to sort of clarify a few definitions, kind of refugees are people who have crossed an international border. So they've crossed into another country when they have fled as opposed to IDPs, which is the green bar at the very bottom, um, who are internally displaced people. So they're people who've been displaced, but within their own country um, and have not crossed an international border. So 70% of refugees are hosted by neighboring countries. So they don't necessarily flee far. Um, in 2022, more than half of all refugees came from three countries, Syria, Ukraine, and Afghanistan. But kind of overall, more than three quarters of refugees are hosted in lower and middle income countries with about 20% of refugees in sort of the, the lowest income countries. Uh, Uganda, which we're gonna hear a little bit about later is the largest refugee host in Sub-Saharan Africa. The majority of their refugees are from DRC in South Sudan, which you can see are among the largest uh, source uh, countries of displaced populations. You can also see Venezuela and Colombia are among also among the highest uh, source and host countries of displacement. And kind of just to also be clear as to how fast things change, these numbers do not include the current crisis in Sudan, um, despite the fact that in 2022, you can see that they were both a source of refugees and a host country, but there have been over 2 million new newly displaced since mid-April. Uh, just again, sort of, there have been over, there are over 70 million internally displaced people at the end of 2022, 90% of whom were displaced by, by conflict or war. 
So when a crisis hits, health needs don't disappear. People still need access to services. Uh, so while the general health of the population declines, we tend to see all health needs increases. So as social structures are compromised, we may see increases in women-headed or adolescent-headed households. We may see increases in sexual assault and sexual exploitation, including transactional sex for survival. Uh, fields may be inaccessible or insecure, or refugees may not be authorized to work once they've arrived in a new country, which can lead to increased food insecurity and malnutrition. Preventive health care is much more challenging to provide, given there's a decrease in health service availability, so we may see increases in infectious disease transmission, including sort of sexually transmitted infections, HIV, outbreaks of measles or cholera. Um, and among others. Uh, there's also increased risk for mental health issues due to war-related trauma or perhaps interruption of treatment. And then just sort of more broadly, routine health needs do not disappear in a crisis. You know, people are still going to have sex, which is gonna result in people, women getting pregnant, people are going to need safe delivery care. Um, we also might see, you know, if in situations like that, again, I, my focus is on SRH, you know, if there's no access to contraceptive services, we'll find increases in unplanned pregnancies and perhaps increased risk of unsafe abortion or maternal death. Uh, so this often starts as very acute needs, but then they do, these needs do actually last long term. Uh, so we, as mentioned, kind of armed conflict is associated with decreased skilled birth attendance, um, vaccination, vaccination coverage. So one study that analyzed data from 181 countries found that maternal mortality and under five mortality were twice as high in countries affected by conflict as opposed to countries that were stable. Um, and we thought they found the highest rates of mortality um, in countries that were classified as, act, as in active war. And these health effects can, be last, can last for years. They don't go away right when the crisis is over. So at the same time we are seeing health needs increasing, crises um, can affect the availability and access to services. Um, so there may be a lack of routine preventive and curative care. So you know, childhood immunizations are lacking, lack of contraception, skilled birth attendance is missing, treatment for malaria, diarrheal diseases, respiratory illnesses, management of chronic diseases. Um, is a problem. There may, we may see displacement or even targeting of health workers, which could lead to a, a health worker shortage. Uh, health facilities may be destroyed in fighting or looted by the various warring parties. And then disruptions in supply chain can result in a lack of supplies or an inability to resupply, as well as an inability to repair or replace damaged equipment. Insecurity, poor roads, et cetera, also compromise the ability to um, seek care. And then, you know, people who tend to be uh, more excluded generally will also have the hardest time accessing services during a crisis. Um, we need to, you know, gender can influence roles in household expectations. These can impact decisions made during a crisis that result in different outcomes for people. And something also to keep in mind is that crises often hit countries that had weak health systems kind of prior to the crisis. So just a little brief overview of what we know about HIV in humanitarian settings. So there's no evidence that conflict and displacement increase HIV incidents. This is because HIV transmission is complex and dependent on the interaction of a variety of factors, of factors including you know, the HIV prevalence in the region of origin and among the host population, the level of interaction or isolation between displaced and surrounding populations. For example, you know, if uh, people are isolated in camps, then there's less mixing between the host and the displaced population. How long are people displaced? But we do know that the characteristics of displacement at war um, also are the kinds of things that increase populations vulnerability and risk for HIV at the same time that there is reduced access to prevention care and treatment services. Uh, one thing that is important to note is that the prevention of 
uh, HIV and sexually transmitted infection uh, transmission and the reduction of the related morbidity and mortality is one of the minimum standards for emergency response. Uh, this means that even in the acute emergency response, there should be safe um, blood transfusion, uh, application of standard precautions, guaranteed availability of free condoms, and support for continuation of treatment for people who are already were already on antiretroviral therapy before they um, were displaced. Generally, I would say uh, the availability of HIV care and treatment services is very mixed in humanitarian settings. Um, it's more likely to be available in countries that have strong national HIV care and treatment programs, more likely to be available at sort of secondary care level. It's quite rare, I would say, at primary care level. Um, and you know, some countries do integrate displaced populations into their national health system or their national care and treatment programs, while others do not. However, evidence does in places where care and treatment is available, the evidence shows that adherence and patient outcomes in displaced contexts are comparable to those in stable settings. And even in places where there have been upswings in violence, they have found that these interruptions in treatment can be managed uh, with planning and care. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next up, we'll have Dr. Barraro. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, to both. Go for it. Excellent. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I will be presenting the preliminary findings from the Uganda Refugee Population-Based HIV Impact Assessment, which is also known as RUFIA 2021. Huh. Okay. Um, so Uganda hosts about 1.5 million refugees the farthest large refugee population in the world, and the largest in Africa. And the Uganda's approach to refugee hosting has been repeatedly praised as an example of progressive refugee response policies. So in Uganda, refugees are allowed to own land, to conduct uh, business transactions, and socially integrate with the wider community, and they have access to social services such as uh, healthcare, such as school. Um, RUFIA 2021 is the first ever refugee HIV impact assessment survey to be conducted. It was a household based survey uh, to measure the impact of HIV response among adults living in the Uganda refugee settlements. It was conducted between October and December 2021. It offered HIV counseling and testing with return of results. Um, in addition, uh, field workers collected information about uptake of HIV care and treatment services. The key objectives uh, for RUFIA 2021 were to estimate the prevalence of HIV among adults living in the of Uganda, and to estimate the prevalence of viral suppression, which was defined as HIV RNA of less than 1,000 copies per ml again among adults living within the, with HIV in the refugee settlements of Uganda. Uh, this slide shows the map of Uganda, uh, with triangles showing you where the refugee settlements are. Uh, and most refugee settlements are located in the West Nile and Mid North regions, uh, which for purposes of this survey, we are collectively referred to as the West Nile region. Uh, we also have refugee settlements in the Midwestern and Southern regions of the country, which in this survey referred to as the Western region. Uh, the countries of origin for refugee populations, most of uh, the 
people come from South Sudan, that is 65.5%. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, 26.7%. Burundi, a small percentage at 3 Somalia, 2.2%. Rwanda, 1.2%. And there are refugees from other countries as well. Uh, Rufia 2021 was led by the government of Uganda, so the Ministry of Health. We obtained funds to conduct this from the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and uh, there was technical assistance uh, with, from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Implementation for Rufia was done by ICAP and the Ministry of Health in collaboration with the Uganda institutions within the country, the Uganda Virus Research Institute, Office of the Prime Minister, the Bureau of Statistics, UNHCR, regional referral hospitals, as well as local government authorities. Earlier this year, uh, the summary sheet for this survey was released, and uh, on the right-hand side of the slide is shown it, the summary sheet is shown. And uh, the preliminary findings that I'm presenting in, uh, in this today are derived primarily from the summary sheet. How did we go about uh, RUFIA? HIV testing was conducted in each household using a serology for rapid diagnostic testing algorithm, which is based on the country's national guidelines. In addition, there was laboratory confirmation of seropositive samples using a supplemental survey, uh, assay, I'm sorry. Um, for confirmed HIV positive samples, laboratory based testing was conducted, for quantitative evaluation of viral load, and uh, qualitative detection of selected antiretrovirals, including efavirenz, Dotogriva, Atazanavir, and Lopinavir. Um, incident estimation was not included in this survey, and all estimates in this survey were weighted. And in terms of response rates uh, of the 1,250 eligible households, 93.4% completed the household interview, and among 2,999 eligible adults, 2,705 consented to participate and were interviewed and tested for HIV. And so the overall response rate for adults was 84.2%. And for women, it was 87.3%. And for men, it was 79.5%. This slide shows the key findings from Rufia 2021. Uh, firstly, the prevalence of HIV among adults aged 15 years and older living in Uganda's refugee settlements was 1.5. It was 1.8% among women and 1.1% among men. And then the prevalence of viral load suppression among adults living with HIV in Uganda's refugee settlements was 72.4%. Um, viral load suppression was 64.2% among women, but the estimates among men were uh, was suppressed because the denominator was below 25. These estimates of uh, viral load suppression were among all adults living with HIV, regardless of their knowledge of HIV status or use of antiretroviral therapy. So when you look at this slide and see uh, results that are statics, um, the estimates was best uh, um, was based on the denominator of between 25 and 49 participants, and should be interpreted with caution. Uh, this slide is showing uh, HIV prevalence among adults by age and sex. And, uh, when you look at women, HIV prevalence ranged between 0.4% of those aged 15 to 19 to 6.2% among those aged 45 to 49. Among men, it ranged between 0.5% among those aged 15 to 19 
to 5.8% among those aged 50 to 54. Uh, this slide shows HIV prevalence by region. In the West Nile region, which is the, uh, you know, the upper westerly part of the country, um, the prevalence was 1.4, and in the west, western region, 1.6. And uh, as the confidence center was sure, these prevalences may not have been that different. Inset on the lower right hand side corner of the slides, the map of the country showing the various regions. And it is uh, also showing prevalence of HIV in the various regions of the country in the general population uh, based on data from. Another survey, the wider fear, the Uganda population based HIV impact assessment that was done in 2020. And overlaid with that um, are the regions for the Rufia, for the refugee survey. Um, whereas whereas the, the regions from the two surveys may not be directly compared, they are kind of structured differently one would be able to see that the prevalence is tending to be lower in the refugee population. Um, when uh, we looked at the achievement of the 95, 95, 95 targets among adults living with HIV, for those diagnosed in Uganda refugee settlements, 81.8% of adults living with HIV we are aware of the HIV positive status. Individuals were classified as aware if they, were report, if they reported their HIV positive status or had a detectable ARV in their blood. So that's the first 95. And the second 95, among adults living with HIV who were aware of their status, 89.5 were on ART. And so for this, um, for this the result, individuals were classified as being on ART if they reported current ART use or had a detectable error in their blood. And for the last 90 uh, among adults on ART, 92.5 had viral uh, load suppression. The corresponding figures are 80, in women are 80.1%, uh, 87.0%, 88.1%. And the estimates were suppressed among men because the denominator was below 25. Um, again, when we have when we present results with aesthetics, the estimate is based on a denominator between 25 and 49, and so it will be interpreted accordingly. So our preliminary conclusions for the 95, 95, 95 targets uh, among the adult refugees living with HIV in Uganda, progress toward achievement for the first and second 95 targets remain, remains below 90 which was the target for 2020. So there is a need to improve case finding um, and also to improve the linkage to treatment within these communities. The response to treatment among those on ART is approaching the third 95 target for the prevalence of DLS. Um, and then in terms of conclusions, with regards to HIV and viral load suppression prevalence, uh, we noted that there were no differences in the prevalence of HIV by region. Uh, also, the adults living with HIV identified in the survey were too few to estimate regional prevalence of viral load suppression or differences in the prevalence of viral load suppression by sex. Uh, so, our conclusions. Primary conclusions, uh, the sample size, the small sample size 
of the survey limited the ability to generate estimates for some indicators usually reported in tier surveys. Um, in spite of that, this is the first fear survey conducted among adults in refugee settlements of Uganda, and it provides critical information for tailoring the HIV response to these communities. Um, the final report will be coming uh, very soon, coming out very soon, and further findings will be described in the upcoming final report. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. That was great. Um, Dr. Wirtz, you're up next. Okay. Apologies. I lost my buttons for a minute after I started screen sharing. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share these findings with you today and now shifting the focus to the Latin America and Caribbean region. So I think Sarah did a really nice job describing um, really where we are in terms of global displacement and just to sort of reorient to what's happening in the Latin America and Caribbean region. Um, the Venezuelan crisis is really one of our largest um, uh, global displacement events uh, currently. Um, it started around 2014, 2015, when there was um, an increase in political instability and then an ensuing economic crisis. In 2017, there was really a peak inflation in the country that's continued today um, and led to a, a, a mass displacement globally. So. Um, on an earlier slide, we saw that Venezuelan was one of the top um, uh, sending countries. And on that slide, it was actually from 2022 estimated about 5 million people. Even in the last year, that's significantly increased. So as of February of 2023, we estimate that there's about 7.2 million Venezuelans who've been displaced globally. The vast majority of them have stayed in the Latin America and Caribbean region. And Colombia is really one of the most significant host countries. They have about 2.5 million Venezuelans who are estimated to reside in Colombia. There's also a lot of cross-border movement where people um, in many contexts and border cities will come across to access services and then return to Venezuela as well. So that's quite significant. And just to put it into perspective, in Venezuela, in Venezuela this means a loss of about 20% of their population. And in Colombia, it's been an increase of about 5% in that population and their um, national population. That's important as well to keep in mind that Colombia has also experienced decades of internal conflict um, and internal displacement. So they're, they've been quite welcoming, but it is has been challenging because they've, had, they've been dealing with internal displacement and now trying to host um, a significant number of people who are crossing the borders as well. So one of the challenges we often think in, uh, with displacement about the complexity of accessing healthcare, we often may not be aware of what is the epidemiology of infectious disease or chronic diseases for displaced populations. Um, many times we think about social and structural vulnerabilities that migrants and refugees experience that might increase risk for worse health outcomes. Um, but it's also important to remember that people are displaced and they flee to actually seek protection and safety. So in some cases, actually, they might have access to better um, uh, health services. It might improve situations. But the challenge is that we don't know. And that's true for um, many Venezuelan refugees and migrants as well. Uh, you can see from all of the articles on the right side, there was a lot of discussion early on around the impact on access to health care. There was really a... a um, uh, uh, dismantling of the public health infrastructure where traditional epidemiologic surveillance stopped or were not made publicly available. There were um, interruptions in access to drugs in Venezuela, et cetera. Um, and so for those who are residing in host countries, we often don't know their HIV prevalence um, or other health indicators for that group, despite that there's many sort of concerns around the impact on uh, local communities. But I think it's important when we think about right to health and, and in this setting, but also as we're talking about 
global displacement as well, that um, most of the countries globally have really signed and ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And this is the international human rights documents that um, outlines the right to health as an inclusive right, that all people, regardless of citizenship, should have access to the highest, um, uh, to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. It's not to say that everyone has the best healthcare and highest techno greatest technology possible, but in that particular setting, they have the same enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of, of care. And so you can see this map on the right. This is produced by the UN Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, that the vast majority of countries, those in blue, have either signed or ratified that covenant. So only those in orange have not. Um, but the challenge is that in practice, we see it, that it's quite heterogene um, heterogeneous in terms of HIV services for migrants and refugees. So this map on the bottom right is produced by HIV Policy Lab, and they look at which countries um, allow or have a policy that allows migrants to access healthcare under the same conditions as citizens. And so you can see here, those countries in orange have not adopted such a policy. There's some partial adopt ad adoption represented by those in yellow, and the countries in blue have adopted. And so it's really a mix across the globe um, and in many settings that are hosting uh, migrants and refugees. In Colombia, um, the challenge is that people who have an irregular migration status do not have access to those services because they can't access health insurance. So someone who has gone through the process who has a regular migration status, in the US we use the terms documented or undocumented, but those who have a regular migration status can access formal employment and then they can access health insurance under their employment, or if they're unemployed, they can access the subsidized systems. People who do not, who have an irregular status cannot access any of that. So for a long time, there had been drug donations from the US and from Brazil, and actually continue from Brazil today, um, to provide um, HIV treatment for displaced uh, Venezuelans in Colombia. So our goal was really to estimate HIV prevalence and other morbidities among Venezuelans, recently arrived Venezuelans in Colombia, um, and really with a goal of informing health and humanitarian programming. We worked under a community research policy partnership that included um, a collaboration with uh, our community partner, Red Somos. Um, we, we were the research institute at Johns Hopkins University, and we partnered with the Ministry of Health and Social Protection. And the study was funded um, and had technical support by the US CDC. So very briefly in terms of methodology, this was a cross-sectional design um, and in two sites that each site was comprised of two cities, neighboring cities. So Bogota and Soacha in the middle of Colombia and then Barranquilla and Soledad on the Atlantic coast. Um, and we enrolled um, adult Venezuelans who had arrived uh, in Colombia since 2015. We used um, a respondent driven sampling methodology, which is um, very briefly a um, peer network based or peer uh, referral based sampling methodology that um, recruits and samples people within the wider social network and allows us with appropriate weighting to approximate a um, probability sample or um, population estimates, prevalence estimates. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic and because people are very networked on, so on WhatsApp, we integrated WhatsApp within the RDS sampling system so that peers could invite each other through WhatsApp as well. Participants completed a socio-behavioral survey questionnaire, as well as a rapid HIV and syphilis test. Anyone who had, who had a reactive test for HIV and or syphilis provided an additional blood specimen for laboratory-based confirmatory testing, CD4 counts and viral load. And what's important here, so if you remember a few slides ago, I mentioned that people don't necessarily have access to insurance. If they don't have insurance, they can't access HIV testing, care or treatment. And so that becomes an ethical challenge in research if you're testing people, what happens if they can't access HIV treatment? So our partners, and this, I really wanna underscore the importance of a community partnership. They designed a legal triage system. They hired lawyers and they brought these lawyers in and anyone who tested positive for HIV or syphilis underwent this legal support in which the lawyers reviewed all of their documentation, 
worked with them to complete the appropriate documentation so they could start that regularization process. As soon as the paperwork submitted, um, individuals can access what's called a salvo conducto, which gives them the access to um, to healthcare services that gives them like a temporary insurance. And so this really provided a long-term sustainable solution for people who were diagnosed on, in the course of the study to access and be sustained on HIV uh, treatment. So we conducted um, this study between July 2021 and February of 2022. Overall, we enrolled over 6,220 participants um, in the four cities. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with RDS, this is just an one network diagram um, the, from one seed, the seed in the middle here is there, this node in the middle is the seed. And you can see here, this particular participant had a recruitment depth of 14 waves and they their, their network alone recruited 1,459 recruits. Um, overall, we had 21 seeds across the four cities and uh, an average of 17 waves of recruitment depth. So I won't go into too much uh, detail on population characteristics, but one thing that I think is worth noting is that over half of um, Venezuelans in Colombia had completed secondary education, and another 22 percent had higher uh, had completed higher education. And so, but despite that high level of education, you can see that about 42 percent remain, remained unemployed in Colombia, and another 41 percent were employed only through an informal system. And that really reflects this difference in terms of regular or mi irregular migration status. So about 71% of um, Venezuelans uh, at the time were uh, had an irregular migration status, which limits their access to formal employment. We asked participants about primary motivations for migration. And really the top reason was food insecurity. So about half reported food insecurity as a motivation, and another 28% reported job insecurity as a motivation for, Colum uh, for migration to Colombia. But it's important to see that in terms of structural and uh, determinants uh, of health, we see that over 70% re really across regular and irregular migration status received less than minimum wage in Colombia. And then the vast majority over 90 or about 90% had low or very low food security, according to the USDA um, food security measure that we use. Another 20% had moderate or severe anxiety or depression and alcohol use or active alcohol use disorders. But despite all of that, about 75% reported good to excellent self-reported health status. And I think that's really important to remember how resilient uh, um, communities are, even in um, displacement. So some quick um, HIV testing and prevention statistics. One of the challenges I think that we see is not only challenges in access to health services in Colombia, but also in Venezuela. So about 53% reported a lifetime HIV test. And it was really mixed. People had been tested in Colombia. Some had been tested in Venezuela. Um, in terms of sexual behavior, uh, I will say that 90% reported lifetime sexual activity. The median numbers of partners, though, in the last 12 months was one with an IQR of one to two. So it's really a, a relatively low risk behavioral, low behavioral risk group. Um, we see that about 31% report using a condom at last sexual intercourse. And I think that largely reflects access to preventative services, but also that people are generally in a monogamous relationship and feel like they're in um, committed partnerships. Um, in terms of HIV prevalence, overall, we estimated that the prevalence was 0.9% with a 95% confidence interval of 0.6 to 1.4. It was slightly higher in Barranquilla and Soledad at 1.2% compared to Bogota and Sawatch at 0.8, but the confidence intervals overlap, so they're relatively comparable. Um, we also see um, relatively higher uh, HIV prevalence among men, um, and this is actually similar to a pattern we see in the Latin America and Caribbean uh, region as well, um, slightly lower among women, again, with overlapping confidence intervals um, and higher levels among uh, um, key populations, particularly men who have sex with men at about 9.5%. Notably, of the people who were living with HIV, about 23% were co-infected with syphilis. Um, and syphilis, I won't get into the details here, it's, 
it's it's been very complicated to roll out um, treatment for syphilis and uh, for Venezuelan migrants in Colombia. In terms of the HIV care continuum, um, we see that overall of the people who are living with HIV, 48% had been previously diagnosed. Um, of those who were previously diagnosed, 79% uh, were currently or were on treatment in the last 12 months. And then of those on treatment, about 93% had a suppressed viral load. So these are pretty good indicators. However, the downside is that overall, among all people living with HIV, only 35.2% had a suppressed viral load. And that really reflects this gap in terms of HIV diagnosis. So we looked at correlates of viral suppression and notably found two, two major things that stand out. First is that um, for people living, uh, people who were tested, we see those who were tested, last tested in Colombia, their odds of um, having a suppressed viral load were about 90% lower than people who had been last tested in Venezuela. That means there's either they're not getting access to timely testing and diagnosis or they're not getting linked to care. And that odds rate, that odds is about the same as basically not never being tested. So that's really an important finding. The second piece is this component here in terms of regular migration status. So when we look at adjusted HIV prevalence, there's no difference in by migration status. But what you see here is that people who have an irregular migration status have a 70% lower odds of viral suppression than those with irregular status. And so that's really important because that tells us that all of the benefits that come with having a regular migration status uh, are significant in terms of enabling people to access treatment and maintain adherence so that they have continued viral load suppression. That's not available to people who don't have, who are lacking that regular migration status. So in terms of what's next, that's a pretty significant finding, but I'll say that the Colombian government, um, as we were implementing this, uh, passed uh, what they call the 10-year temporary protection status for Venezuelans in Colombia. This is probably one of the most significant policy levels interventions that I can think of. It grants a 10-year temporary protection status to all Venezuelans in the country. All they, they have to go through you know, a fairly complicated process to register and ultimately access those permits, but it gives them basically a flat protection status so that they can then access insurance, health insurance. That's a, it's a great intervention. I think it's been a bit more complicated because of all the steps that people have to go to through to both register for their um, permits, but also then to access health insurance. But I think that's something we want to watch over the next few years is, is this a policy um, intervention that has impacts on um, health indicators uh, for Venezuelans? And is that something that could be scaled up in other countries as well? Um, some re recent cost analyses have shown that providing access to, uh, to insurance and allowing people to access preventative services is less expensive than paying for emergency care for people living with HIV. So that's something we want to continue to monitor over time. And I'll say also the regional response and the attention to this has been really um, amazing and regional coordination and something as well that I think can serve as a model for other settings um, hosting displaced communities. So I'll end there with an acknowledgement of all of the people who've done a tremendous work for this study. Um, and thank you for your time listening to the presentation. And just for those who are interested, we have several articles published. Our most recent one with the HIV findings is published this last week in Lancet HIV. And the first Spanish language podcast will be published in July um, with Miguel Barriga, who's the director of Red Somos, and Dr. Ricardo Luque, who's um, the director of sexual and reproductive health at the Ministry of Health and Social Protection. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. That was great. And congrats on the uh, recent publication. Um, I, have, I have a couple questions for you, actually, because um, you mentioned a, a couple of things that caught my attention. Um, when you were talking about the the RDS sampling, you you mentioned the that you used a WhatsApp in integration. Can you explain briefly how how that worked? Yeah, and so that was partly um, <laughs> I guess encouraged by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of move towards trying to make RDS 
uh, more available through digital methods. Um, mm -hmm. But in this particular context, because of the pandemic at the time, we were we had social distancing measures and we had we didn't want people to have to be meet in person to pass on the traditional RDS coupon. Mm -hmm. So what we did is with we have a, a an in-house system that we develop and it allows people to send messages with coupons. So we initially send them their first message um, and they can then pass it on with unique coupons via WhatsApp. And then our system also had um, integrated WhatsApp to just have individual communication through and, and um, protected communication through WhatsApp. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated because WhatsApp is now owned by um, Meta. Uh, and basically mm -hmm. any communication now that is kind of a standard communication has to be reviewed by Meta <clears throat> prior to approving it. So it does take a little bit of work to send them all the messages and have them review it and approve it in a timely manner. But I would say that was really, that integration was really significant because it allowed a very timely response. Um, sometimes people invited their peers within the same day. It actually became, you know, our, our team had to work very diligently because we had to schedule appointments through the pandemic. Um, but I think it really changed. I, I'm not sure we would have had the same outcomes with RDS if we had just gone the traditional coupon route as we did in this particular case. And, and I will also say that we had, you know, it's a very networked population across the country. So um, we had a few people revite, invite um, individuals from other sites and people certainly, I, I mentioned that there were two cities in each, in each site. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of mobility within those two cities in both locations. And so people could invite across cities as well. And that was quite common. Very cool. Thank you. And then my other question that I, I came up while listening was you mentioned that, that the syphilis treatment was complicated for, for migrants. Is there a, a, I don't know, a reasonable answer for why, why that is? I think I, I'll say I don't think there's been a lot of research to explain it. Anecdotally, um, at least for pregnant women, they require the three um, course treatment. And that's been very complicated because it's been difficult to, to um, have people come back multiple times to access that treatment. Um, there's been a lot of work on the border cities to try and support this because they tend to see um, those individuals who they call pendulares, they come back and forth between Venezuela and Colombia. Um, and the challenge mm -hmm. there is being able to have people come back, but also providing treatment for partners. So their partners may say in Venezuela, um, uh, but someone's being treated here. And so mm. it's sort of, they're wanting to try to provide treatment to partners, but can't access the partners. And so there's a risk of reinfection in that way. It's also the, the individuals who can provide treatment. Um, you have to, you often have to go to particular clinics and access it. So it's, it's very complicated uh, for a lot of people, even when you take insurance out of the picture. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that does sound complicated. And and I we did get one more question for you in the Q and A. Um, was the RDS able to distinguish between migrants with intentions to stay in Colombia versus those transitioning to destinations outside of Colombia? Mm -hmm. So actually, I'll say in our study, we focus on the four cities we focus on are cities in which people tend to stay there. Um, they're not there isn't a large transit population or pendular prop. Uh, population like you would see on the border cities. And we did that specifically because we wanted to estimate prevalence for people who were, were planning to reside and stay in Colombia. And then within our inclusion exclusion criteria, we also um, uh, excluded people who were in transit or pendular, um, which was pretty low because of our uh, city selection. But the goal there was really to be able to estimate for people who would be staying in Colombia. So it's not really generalizable to people in the border cities or who are in transit. Fair enough. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now, yeah. Sarah and Sam, we've, we've got a, a follow up question for you. Thanks, Sam, for answering a, a bunch of the questions in the chat. And Sarah, so there had been a question about um, Uganda refugees uh, living in the host community and how they have access to health services, which, which Sarah had answered that they have access to health care via the local Ministry of Health facilities and that the UN agencies support the MOH to provide the services to refugees. And there was a follow-up question 
and Sam or Sarah, I'm not sure who's best place to answer, but um, Nahabin wanted to know if the MOH have a platform established to monitor the attendance of refugees in these health facilities. Yes, uh, the Ministry of Health runs the uh, HMI uh, system, and, uh, which, which collects a whole range of uh, the pieces of data to monitor what's going on with regards to HIV service provision. So yes, there's a decent uh, database to collect and manage and evaluate data. Great, thank you, Sam. And I don't know if you would know this either, but um, do they, do you have, do you know about anything about the gender-based violence case notification and services that are provided in the refugee camps? Or Sarah, would you? So they, there is a system um, nationally, so the, the gender-based violence cases are handled by a certain ministry, ministry of uh, actually gender, uh, labor, and uh, social welfare. If, um, and uh, there are organizations that handle gender-based violence. And, uh, as part of our survey, we actually recommended when we detected the evidence of gender-based gender violence. We re referred uh, individuals that we thought were eligible for assistance to those organizations that um, are identified by that relevant ministry. Uh, but also the NGOs that work in these, uh, um, in these settlements, uh, several of them, if not all of them, have as part of their service provision uh, response to gender-based violence. So those individuals that may be in the refugee camps and are experiencing that uh, mechanism of reporting to those NGOs uh, who then respond appropriately. Over. Thank you, Sam. Um, so that, I think that's all the time we have for questions right now. Thank you everybody for attending today. This webinar recording and the slides will be posted at www.icap.columbia.edu probably today or tomorrow. Our next Grand Rounds will be Tuesday, July 18th at 9 a.m. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you very much to all of our presenters. This was really interesting. And I hope you guys all have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.